So I guess, are we ready then, Sarah, to go ahead and proceed? Yep, so everyone, this is being recorded. Thank Once you. We're today, we'll send it out with a copy of the slides that Cheryl and Julie share with us today. Thank you. So good afternoon, um, Sarah, is it okay if I go ahead and then share my screen first and then we'll get started? Perfect. So good afternoon, my name is Julie Mergel and I'm a senior manager here at the Office of Public Instruction. I oversee the Department of School Innovation and Improvement. And the topic today is unique to class seven, our Native American language and culture education licensure licenses. Um, and I, as part of being the senior manager of this department, I oversee the licensure unit. Um, also joining us today are Cheryl Allen, our deputy superintendent, Mike Jetty, our Indian education specialist, and Lana Running Wolf, our director of American Indian student achievement. So, um, I didn't know, Mike, if you wanted to say, I know you've said hi already, and Mike's going to be able to answer some questions for us, um, and then Cheryl as well, and Lana. Hello, my relatives, hope you're having a good day. Uh, Mike Jetty, member of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation and a Turtle Mountain Chippewa descendant. Work with Indian Education for All at OPI and happy to be a part of the conversation today about native language and culture. So, Yata A, this is your good friend Cheryl coming to you from her adopted roots into the Navajo uh, culture and tribe. It is a pleasure to be with you and to share with you. Thank you, Cheryl. I know, um, Sarah, can you send the link to Lana? She's trying to find it and is not. It. Oh, you there. Yay. <laughs> Lana, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sunny Daffy, you guys can all say Sukafi. Say Sukafi. 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 Nidane go ikinoko me. My name is Lon or my name is Gentle Rolling Thunder. I'm from the Blackfeet tribe. And uh, I just said, hello, how are you doing? And you said, good, real good. <laughs> Welcome, Lana. So you guys, what I wanted to do is just take some time to show you some of the current data um, that we have for our class seven licenses. And just to kind of talk about the role and responsibility that the tribal councils have with this unique license. And then just to ensure some time at the end here for you to ask any questions that you might have or make any recommendations about the class seven um, overall. So uh, just uh, very quickly as a, as a background, in November of 1995, the Board of Public Ed um, approved a certification title called Class 7 American Indian Culture, Language and Culture Specialist to teach the Native American languages. Um, and so this certificate was in, put in place to ensure the quality of the native language instruction for our Montana children. And so, um, a little bit more about this particular teacher license. So um, we have all kinds of class, class license. We have professional teachers license. We have CTE licenses. We have specialist license for school counselors. This one is to our language and culture. Um, and when you get this license um, that you hold, it is valid for five years. And this is the piece that's really special about this license is that when it's issued, it's verified by an authorized representative of the tribal government. And so we have an OUs on file here with the superintendent that um, kind of outlines how the tribes um, determine how applicants meet the tribal standards for competencies and fluencies for their unique languages. And so they determine at the tribe level who's going to do that. Um, and so um, that is here is like an MOU um, on file. And it's also on file with the Board of Public Ed of how um, those individuals will be um, established as being competent. Um, I think this is a unique thing, but they may also be approved to pitch driver's ed. Um, 
oh boy, that went really quick as I was trying to move my screen down. Um, they get renewed again by verification from the tribe uh, to determine after five years, what are the professional development activities or ongoing learning that they want the individuals to continue to have within the language and culture to keep that license. Um, and then the school district may assign this particular um, educator uh, to just work with Indian language and culture and not have to um, you know, do other things within the school beyond that. So sometimes they teach like elective classes where they teach just the language. They may push in with another teacher and be teaching language in an immersion classroom as well. Um, and then there's no other duties that, that they are assigned, if you will, um, as part of that. So that's just kind of the rules a little bit around the license. I think the most important pieces are you know, is that it's authorized. And so when we get an application and they apply to get this license, then they have to have it signed off by someone at the tribe. So I wanna share some data about these licenses. And I also wanna note, when you look at this graph here, that they're counting endorsements, not necessarily the number of teachers, because we do have some folks who hold uh, a license to teach both Chippewa and Cree. Um, and so that person would show up in both that five and their 15. So what we see here is with the different languages that are offered here, um, Blackfeet, there are currently 41 endorsements for someone to be teaching the Blackfeet language out there. Okay, and then the next highest would be Cheyenne. And so that you can see here, we only currently have one teacher license who can teach um, Kootenai. And so these are folks who are in different places, if you will, um, of that five year span. So <clears throat> some of those that we just looked at there, like when we think about the, the ones that hold that black feet, the 41, some will renew in 2021, some will renew in 22, some will, will renew in 25 because it goes for five years. Um, and so when we look at this, we can see that um, this year, right now renewals for 2021 are open and so there's six, 36 different individuals from across those different languages um, that uh, will be up for renewal this year okay so these are the total number but again um, it's across that five span so i did want to share with you what did it look like just this year so far right um, in the school year of 2021 Starting back in last year of folks applying, we had seven new licensees across these languages. One was, was for Assiniboine, seven for our Blackfeet, and one for the Cree. And so we can see a total of nine. Um, there's quite a few of the different languages where we did not have any new licenses applied for in this past school year. In terms of of folks whose licenses would have been due in 2020. Um, this is the number of folks that renewed their license for a total of 10. So I think it's important to be taking a look at of those that we've had, how many are keeping it. So, so far we've had one person from the Blackfeet who extended it beyond that five years. So I took this data and I was really curious. So I was like, okay, so we've this amount of people who've applied for new licenses this year, this amount of people who've been doing renewals, what's the rate of renewal? Like for those folks who do get that initial class seven license, how often are we keeping them? Okay, so this is a pretty complicated table. Um, and so it just, the important piece here is um, kind of looking across the top there. So the so if we look at the Cinnaboyne, who renewed at least once within the last five years? They had three people. Those three people hold a current license right now and they renewed it within the last five years. And then we had um, three people who have renewed at least um, one time from 2014 to 2019, but are no longer current. So they know, so they basically, they held it and they no longer hold it, okay? And so when I was looking at this data, I wanted to know, hmm, 
than how many applied for a license and never renewed it in this 2014 through 2019 span. So they had it and then they never renewed it. Okay, there were nine for a Cinnaboyne, right? So what's the approximate rate of renewal? Well, I wanted to take a look at is how many had the potential to renew out of the total that were given. So when we look at that, we're seeing that there were six people who held a license to teach in that language um, and then renewed to keep it and maintain it. It was at about 40%. Versus when we look at the black feet, there's a much higher rate of renewal, meaning once they get that license, they maintain it and keep it. Um, and so that's at a much higher rate. And then I wanted to take a look at you guys like, ooh, how many have started that license since 2019 and are up for potential renewal um, that are current that we can keep? And so I think what's important to notice is when you're taking a look at who's getting, oh, sorry, licenses in the different languages, are they maintaining? And do we see the number growing from how many were at one point in time in the language and then either getting initials or renewing. So Salish, um, I think is one that's really interesting to me. Um, you look over here, they've had five initials in the last five years that are current. And then they've got 13 that could be potentially up for renewal versus if you look back from 14, 15, boy, they didn't have a whole lot as many there, right? So they've almost doubled, if you will, even the potential of how many they're getting and how many they're keeping. So my question becomes like, I wonder what's happening um, over there with the Salish Kootenai component where they're getting more people to help kind of keep that language and that culture going. Um, we see Blackfeet, same thing, but there's a couple that you guys, it's like, oh boy, I don't know what's happening there, right? Um, when you look um, at like, um, Dakota, the three we had, we've kept, right? That's kind of grown a little bit. Um, the Cree though, the rate of renewal is not very high, right? It's only 35%. So I just think there's two things happening here that are really, really important. Are we, um, how do we see, you know, like are, for all the different languages, is there, is there a percentage of people where we're getting new people? But of the people that we get, are we also keeping them and helping them renew their licenses? One last thing, just so that you kind of can put this into perspective. Um, this is the number of licenses overall in Montana um, for all the different types of teacher licenses that we give. So this class seven make up a very small percentage. When we think about the initial license, that blue line there, so we had 1,251 and we, we, and those are new license of class seven. We, um, if you look back at that chart, there was a total of nine new ones. And then renewal, remember was 10. So if you look at that light blue of the 5,530 of things that are happening to keep the licenses current, there was a total of 10. Um, I think, I'm gonna pause there for a minute because there's so much data that I've shared before I go to the next piece. So questions just on the data or some things that you want me to just kind of go back um, so you can ask anything about the data. Hi, Jonathan. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing hey, well. Yeah, the question I have uh, relating to some of your data and some of your uh, information that you provided, uh, what, uh, how did you get, how did you collect this? How did you gather that? Because I just, uh, I'm, I'm just curious on my tribe. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. So, you know, we have a system at the state of Montana um, for licensing um, and we keep all of the different data in there of the number of new licenses that we're giving or um, licenses that even have once we've held and have expired and not renewed. 
um, as well as those that are renewing. So it's um, within there that we pulled the numbers. I have another question uh, on a different, kind of a different note, I guess. Uh, um, you might have seen some of the things that's been happening. I have another question. Can you hear me? Yes, Jonathan. Uh, the, the, the second part of that question I have is that uh, you probably have seen some of the actions that's been going on in section E and uh, as far as how this, what you're presenting today would uh, tie into the digital academy that's gonna be expanding. And then uh, also the same goes with uh, uh, other areas as far as uh, uh, is this going to be like say for example on the HHS side I've expanded uh, language for to include native language in uh, <clears throat> in the uh, recipient that has that 25 hour work week requirement to look for work and when you're coming from a com from a community that has 50, 60 percent unemployment rate, the chances are going to be pretty slim that you're going to find a job. So that so that uh, this is what this what this bill that's in the Senate side now is going to do is to expand that to allow the recipient to uh, take up languages as far as uh, whatever language in tribal colleges is going to happen. Then then it's, uh, the, the language is so broad that uh, it's going to allow non-tribal TANF recipients, which is roughly 2,500 TANF recipients statewide. So the standards that you mentioned here and this with this class seven certification to pursue uh, this area and the standards of being becoming a class seven certified instructor, then this, I assume is probably going to fall into the same area of of uh, expectation on on the class seven certification. That makes sense. Yep, it does. And I know Jonathan. I'm um, just kind of looking here. Um, we know that each tribe, right, yeah. verifies from their own tribal government of who does meet those tribal standards for competency and fluency, right? Um, mm. And that really resides with them as setting that criteria. And what's interesting, Jonathan, when I was looking at the MOUs, I kind of went in and I thought, I wonder, you know, how are each tribe kind of using them differently? Um, and right now with the Northern Cheyenne, their tribe has designated the Chief Dole Knife College to be the one yeah. responsible for the development of that curriculum. Yeah. And they're the ones that also give the, the exams um, for, this, for the Northern Cheyenne language, right? To determine that um, versus like at the Kootenai Salish, they actually have culture committee directors that are authorized to design and administer the language and culture exams. So it's really interesting to see the different ways that each tribe is um, authorizing, if you will, um, who, right? Um, mm -hmm. They are issuing the, you know, verification that yes, indeed, this individual meets our expectations um, mm -hmm. for that language. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. I have another <clears throat> issue that I'd like to bring up too, that's going through the whole system. And we have a shared policy goal with the uh, Ochi and what we're working on what I and what I challenged them on was uh, that since we have uh, uh, some of these programs going through and everything as well as into the Office of Commissioner of Higher Education level that uh, we should be having an end goal and where we're going through this whole system is how I envision this and that's what I'm pushing through the <clears throat> the legislative process is that when a kid begin school whether it be pre-k head start or wherever that's that's the bottom rung of the whole thing of language learners and whatnot and it goes from k to 12 and then from tribal colleges into the four-year institutions of the university system so 
<clears throat> so what I ch the challenge I gave him is that why can't we not have a uh, a uh, uh, linguistics program, bona fide linguistics program. So that is something that we're, uh, that they did, they did take on my challenge. And it, and, and, and that's one of the, one of, one, one of my main challenges as far as the existing system is that, that there isn't really a, uh, a system set up right now that's consistent we're from the co tribal college to the four-year institutions because each of the institution has and I've always, and I see Angie on, and she knows that I've been struggling with this uh, uh, tribal college credit transfer for for the longest time, as long as I've been in legislature. And what I plan on doing is uh, uh, is trying to get in a some some type of a program that would be consistent across the board. And I think that this linguistics program language program and the four-year institution is going to be that uh, that pilot project so that those credits transfer from the tribal colleges through the language programs into the four-year system right up into the uh, linguistics program and the four-year degree because it don't make sense for some of our native students to go all the way to Massachusetts to get a linguistics program when we should be able to have to uh, maybe we should have a program we can offer that here in our own state. So anyways, that's just, I, I don't know, I think I'm way ahead of myself. Hello, did I lose you guys? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we were just listening very intently. I was just thinking about, as you're describing, Jonathan, like the linguistics programs and what are we offering? and. I was thinking of it from a systematic approach as you were speaking. So um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to ask you questions, Jonathan, about that or respond. Yeah, because you know, my I'm an outside the box thinker as you can see, and that's how I approach my uh, legislative stuff. So yeah, if anybody has questions on my vision, go for it. <laughs> I can't keep up, this is Lana. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Wendy Boy, uh, Angela McLean here. Uh, always great to uh, hear you on these caucus calls. Um, just a couple of things uh, in regards to the, the linguistics effort. I can tell you that wheels are in motion already on that and they are moving fast. <laughs> Folks heard you loud and clear here. Uh, additionally, on the tri on the uh, Montana Digital Academy and the language effort, uh, I have personally been engaging with Bob Curry and his team there, and working already to connect him to uh, tribal colleges. Um, as uh, was indicated, they are right now the holders of that effort to a large degree, um, but we are working with them already. Uh, and the wheels are in motion to move that piece forward uh, upon uh, upon legislative action. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and I'm glad somebody's listening. I know this is kind of, I know I kind of took with the conversation way off class seven. <laughs> Sorry. Jonathan, what, what, what do you what would you like us to know about like that connecting that to class seven what are your thoughts about about the class seven well you know what's going to happen and and uh i think angie can probably explain a little more about the digital academy is uh i don't think that uh the local level on a tribal level don't see or realize how big of a role that they that they play and that they're that, 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 that they're going to be a part of and I think that message needs to be out there because, you know, some of the folks that I'm going on on our weekly calls, I don't even think they realize it yet, what yet they think they know. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. And what I'd like to do, and maybe this is something that you guys could, uh, be a part of and I was working as uh, Lana is on the phone I've been 
thinking about because there's five areas that are having major roles that's going to be transforming some of the education across Montana from section E on some of the actions that we've taken. And I think that perhaps maybe somebody who's got a whole bunch of bucks in uh, OPI or someplace uh, can sponsor a conference, whether it be virtual or in person or whatever. But what uh, what I proposed to Lana and uh, Representative uh, Tyson Running Wolf is that we need to take this road show, take this on a road show because like I said, you know, tribal communities are uh, gonna be in for a surprise with the presentations that we're gonna give. And I think Rilana can attest to that. Yeah, um, just recently Rocky Boy um, community have started a real powerful collaborative effort towards um, like language immersion and all, and like everything I think that Representative Wendy Boy is working on and they know that um, they're in the, it's been really interesting to sit in on those conversations um, where they're asking to learn more about, you know, like the ILIT program, how they can access that, uh, what the requirements are. And then also just like collaborating on things like class seven and how does the college work, the tribal college work to create language immersion teachers so that when they're graduating, cause they have a four-year program there when they're graduating teachers from their four-year program, they've already had years of language and years of culture um, uh, as part of their teaching um, prep program. And so that they're producing teachers that can enter those classrooms for the immersion, which is something we're, we're struggling with right now. Um, I think something that's, uh, you know, it's really innovative, the, the discussions that they're having and they're pulling all their resources and they're like it had all of their school districts within their tribes, all of their language um, programs or initiatives, everybody has a seat at the table. And so it's been really powerful um, in watch what they're preparing to do. So that's been hopefully something that can happen with other tribes. Um, we have to stop working in, in silos um, and if we really want to produce fluent speaking children, then like we got to pull the resources and work together. And um, I'm just really excited about everything. It's, it's like I said, I can't keep up. It so moves so fast, but it's incredible. Um, thank you for that representative Windy boy. Yeah, you bet. And, and that's one of the things too, I'd like to share with the uh, folks online is that, you know, historically from you know, it's really been like a, a and no offense, a top-down uh, approach. And what we're trying to provide here is having a, a, a from a bottom-up approach. And I think that you guys probably would learn something from this because just like just like the people here in Helena, the at the uh, people at the heads, as well as the people in in in, in the federal government. That's, that's how it is. And that's what we plan on doing as far as some of the curriculum. The majority of my tribe don't even know that the Ojibwe's had originated from the Poconos Mountains in, in, uh, in Pennsylvania. And those are the types of histories that I wanna see set in place instead of just this, everything started in 1492 and there was never anything that was here, that was here before when there was. So that's my goal. We're with you, Jonathan. <laughs> Who is this? Yes, oh, it's so Mike this... Jetty here. Oh, good. hey, 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 Mike Jetty, why don't you give us a joke, man? It's, it's all <laughs> not complete until you tell us the story. <laughs> well, you know, Jonathan, uh, uh, it's really exciting to see what's happening up there with Rocky Boys and Jay Eagleman's keeping a lot of us in the loop here at OPI and to be on that list to see all the exciting stuff going on. but. You know, when you mentioned like uh, maybe something OPI could do is help sponsor some at least virtual conferences 
regionally yeah. to bring people together because I think uh, it'd be good for people in different tribes to hear what's happening. Some of that good stuff that's, you know, moccasins on the ground kind of perspective. But yeah. um, so, you know, my mom's from the Turtle Mountain Reservation and that's Chippewa Cree country up there. And, and uh, Cree and Michif, uh, Kukum and Mushum is how you say uh, grandma yeah. and grandpa. And yeah. so my mom said how they used to make mashed potatoes up there at Turtle Mountain was they'd uh, cook them and mush them. <laughs> and there's, your, there's your bad joke for the day, Jonathan. <laughs> Had you heard that one before? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's an old joke. So. Yeah. So anyways, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I don't know who that was that was giving that presentation sorry about taking this off course but uh this is giving me a bit of thinking here and different approach that montana is going to be taking and the whole education system is going in a whole different direction from the boots up well, hey mike I, oh. yeah man i was gonna say hey mike you're uh I think your joke scared them off. <laughs> Everybody kind of got quiet after that. So <laughs> it's uh, our mute. So we're all <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't know if uh, Sarah or somebody has the mute button running a meeting, so sometimes someone just <laughs> might mute me on purpose. So you never know. <laughs> oh, never, Mike. Never. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is great. We're going to send out the video and the slides. You're welcome to share them with your colleagues and other legislators that you'd like. Next week, meet us back here at four o'clock on Thursday again. Angela and Travis are going to give us a presentation on their program. Angela, do you wanna give us a little snippet of what you're gonna be discussing? Yes, first of all, thank you for having us this afternoon. And next Thursday, we will give you an overview of what is happening with the American Indian and Minority Achievement Council. And we'll take a look at some data there. We'll also give you an update around the tribal college partners and efforts around general education transfer, as well as common course numbering, which is something that was alluded to by Representative Wendy Boy. And then Travis will give you an update on the first time ever seventh year services for Montana Gear Up and how they're impacting American Indian students in their first year on Montana University system and tribal college campuses. Great. Sounds exciting. Thanks, Angela. Thanks, Travis. We'll see you next week. Hey, Bye. I have one more thing if I could mention. Uh, you know, when you're talking about some of these standards that uh, I hope that the focus won't be too much on the uh, tribal college because a lot of the tribal college uh, administrators and and those who are uh, making the big bucks over there don't know, don't speak the language or don't know the language and that you ought to keep the tribal councils in place because they're the ones that are adopting a lot of these uh, things that are being out here, that, that are being practiced out here. And so that uh, what, what, what I would suggest as you moving through these whole processes is that there, there is the need for uh, language and standards to be written by the tribes and adopted by the state instead of the other way around. So I just wanna keep that uh, on the forefront. Thank you. All right, well, thanks for inviting me and allowing me to speak. Of course, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next Thursday, everyone. Have a great evening. You guys. All right, have a good day.